My name is John Pendre. For anyone who doesn't know me, I've been a part of this church for about 10 years. And yes, just get around for sticking in that long. That's worth a round of applause, I guess. Um, so I have the privilege of um, co-directing the School of Worship here with Cal Bergendahl, and it is a, a joy. Are there any school worshipers here in the room today? Come on. We have a fantastic group of students, a big group of students, uh, and it's just it's fantastic to see what, what God is doing amongst us. Uh, just want to say that we do, at the School of Worship, we kick off with worship every single morning. Uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, and you are welcome to come on Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, or Friday. You're absolutely welcome to join us, um, and not only welcome, but we would love to have you with us. We'd love to worship together with the church, so um, please come along to that. Um, we are just uh, kind of transitioning as a school. The worship time's over to the students more and more, so if you come, you'll actually get to see them lead worship, which is very exciting. Um, so yeah, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, and if you want to know what we do on Wednesday mornings, then maybe apply for the school worship and you can come next year. <laughs> but we're going to talk this morning about training in godliness, training in godliness, um, which I felt a little sheepish about when people were asking me what I'm speaking on. I was like, oh, godliness, but, uh, but it's good. This is a good subject for us. So um, Scott taught, uh, we just finished a series, didn't we, an amazing series on the church, and Scott taught on uh, these various different marks or characteristics of the church, and didn't it feel kind of like each one would be a great intro into a whole series? There was just so much to say and so much to cover, but uh, one of the things that he talked about was uh, the fact that we are a disciplined community, the fact that we disciple each other together, we discipline each other together. Uh, and he said that this is a thing that the church, actually, there's been a lot of unity within the church. The church has agreed on this really throughout its history, um, across all of its iterations, or all of its denominations. There's been kind of large agreement on, yes, the church should look like this. But in the last 50 years or so, especially in the West, it's kind of dropped off of the radar of the church, that it's not something that we talk about uh, as much anymore. It's not something that we emphasize, uh, but that it's massively important for us to reclaim it in our day. And so <clears throat> after he talked on that, it was still very much a burden on my heart. And I thought, you know, 50 years of silence isn't going to get corrected by, by one message, is it? So let's keep having this conversation. And so that's what we're going to do today. I'm just hoping to continue that conversation about how do we be a community that is um, given to discipline and discipleship. So exciting topic, right? Um, he, so he talked about the fact that the church is a community, we're to be a community that is growing, that's heading in a direction together, that we're not just a random group of people, but we know where we're going and we're heading towards Christ-likeness, right? That our mission is to look like Christ, to be his body in the earth and that way we uh, transform the earth, right? And he talks about the fact that this wouldn't happen by accident, that we need to know that that's where we're going and we need to engage again in discipline and discipleship for these things to happen. So we're not just a community that says, come on in and we accept you as you are. Uh, we do accept you as you are, but we say, we're going in a direction. We're trying to look more like Christ. If you want to be a part of us, we're going to pull you into that, right? That if you're coming to this church, you're signing up for discipline. You're signing up for change. Um, that's part of what being in church is. And so in short, if you are part of this congregation, you have agreed, whether you realize it or not, you have agreed to enter into training because that's what we're doing together as a people. We're training towards godliness. It's an integral part of the Christian life and it's an integral part of the church and who we are together. So 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 7 through 8 say this. Go into training in godliness. Go into training in godliness. Physical training, you see, has limited usefulness. But godliness is useful or valuable in every way. It carries the promise of life, both now and in the future. You know, I'd never thought much about this passage, apart from it would occasionally kind of flash through my mind as I'm thinking about, um, should I work out this morning? Should I go for a run? And then I think, well, isn't there that passage of scripture that says something about physical training not being that valuable? So... Maybe I won't after all. Um, and what did the rest of that passage say? Ah, I don't remember. And, and to be honest, that was kind of the, the extent of my thoughts about this passage. But the fact is, it's actually making a profound point 
about our spiritual lives, about growing in godliness. It's answering the question of how do we grow in godliness, right? Because that's what we all want. Again, we want to be this people who look like the image of God in the earth, who are transforming and changing things. Um, and so how do we do that? How do we corporately start to look more like Christ? And this uh, verse gives us a very, very simple answer. What does it look like? It looks like training. It looks like we enter into training. That's what we do together. So if you had a goal to run a marathon, say you're running a marathon next year, and I talk to you about it, my, pretty much my first question to you would be, how's the training going, right? How's it going? Do you have a plan? Are you sticking to the plan? This is, this is exciting. This is great. And if you said to me, uh, well, you know, I'm not training as such. I'm not actually running. Um, but I am praying a lot, you know, I'm just praying every night, asking God that he would make me into a marathon runner, that he would transform my life, make me into this marathon runner. I would laugh at you, right? That's, that's completely ridiculous. So not that you shouldn't pray. Yes, absolutely keep on praying. But there's only one way you're going to become a marathon runner, and it's by entering into training. And that's kind of what this verse is saying here, too, is that if we have the goal of godliness, we want to grow, we want to look like Christ. God actually has an answer for us, and it's to enter into training, to grow in godliness. You know, we actually have an Olympic athlete amongst us. Did you guys know that? Yeah. Got Jim Hiring over here, who uh, competed in multiple Olympics and is generally an all-round stud. So, um, <laughs> so God started speaking to Jim earlier this summer about, about training. Um, and when I heard that and knew his history about being an Olympic athlete, it kind of perked up my ears. I wanted to hear what God had said to him. So over to you, Jim. Thank you, John. Everybody hear me OK? Yeah. OK. So when Scott did this, uh, the series on the church, he brought up the word discipline. So what I did, I went home and I worked, looked up the word discipline. And it says, training expected to produce, or to produce a specific type of behavior. Training that produces moral, mental, or physical improvement. So when I was training as an Olympic athlete, discipline was crucial to my success. No matter how good a coach was that I had, or know how good the training plan he laid out for me, if I didn't follow that with a disciplined manner, it was all useless. So following that schedule meant being very disciplined. So that meant getting up in the morning, sometimes before the sun came up, whether it was raining, uh, snow, cold, heat, you went out and you trained. And we never did workouts out of fear or punishment. They were, they were looked on as formative training, not punitive. So these workouts that we did, we knew that they would help us physically, that they would help us mentally accomplish the goals that, we, that, we, you know, that the coach set aside for us to do. So people often ask me, well, you know, it's, it's 10 below zero. It's dark out. What are you doing getting up and going out and, you know, race walking 25 miles? Well, I knew my competitors over in Russia or East Germany were doing the same thing. So if I didn't get up and do it, I was going to be missing a workout that they were doing. So that was motivation, like that discipline to get up there, get outside and do it. The thing is, in our church, we have a coach. It's Jesus. And we have the body of Christ, which is all you guys, to coach and help us be better Christians through discipline. And, right, you know, we have the best training plan in the world right here. It's called the Bible. And the Bible is not punitive. It's formative. It's meant to form you to be a better Christian. So taking the Word of God and putting that into a, a formative method, it's going to make you a successful discipline, a, dis a successful disciple of Christ. And together with the community of the church, we all build to a better church as a whole. You know, the re rewards of being an athlete, an Olympic athlete, you know, uh, being a, a successful Christian far outweigh the rewards of a gold medal, a world record, or any race that you would win. But both require discipline. And following that discipline, following that plan, is what's going to lead us to be a better church, a better community, and a better uh, Christians as a whole. Awesome. Thanks, Jim. 
Um, and the Bible absolutely talks about our lives this way. It talks about us being in a race uh, to win. So 1 Corinthians 9 says this, Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly, right? And we just don't want to get to the end of our lives and think, I just ran aimlessly, right? We want to say, no, I was engaged. I ran to win. I do not box as one beating the air because that would look stupid. Uh, but I discipline my body and keep it under control. So the Bible talks about our lives this way. It says, <clears throat> we're running a race and run it to win. Run it in order to win, okay? Now, this is incredibly good news uh, because what God is saying is um, that we actually have the, God wants to transform our lives into godliness. And what he's saying in this is that there's actual provision to do it. Like your life can change. Your life can be different. You know, I, and it comes through training. I, I see this all the time with people. If I sit down to talk and, um, you know, we're talking about issues that people want to grow in, pe things that they see in their life that they want to work on. So maybe, you know, maybe it's like I close down and I shut off other people and I do it as a, as a it's a bad habit in my life. I don't know how to stop it. Maybe it's uh, I always get stressed out and, and snap at my wife and my kids. Um, I don't know how to grow beyond this. Or maybe it's just simply I can't seem to stop sinning sexually. I've tried and I've tried, but I feel caught in it. You know, these kind of things. Now, there's a common thread here, which is that we have a vision. We actually have a desire to change. You know, we're distressed about it. We want to change. We've made it an object of prayer. We're hoping that one day God will change us. But what many times we fail to realize is that God has provision for us to change, and it's in training. It's in being given to training. As we give ourselves to that, we're going to find that God meets us in it and absolutely transforms our lives. Um, it is pretty incredible to see the effects of training when you see someone really start to give themselves to it. Um, I have an older brother. He's four years older than me. And... Um, he uh, never particularly, he was not, let's just say this, he was not a very athletic guy. How about that? So, uh, so I grew up, I was always more fit than him. I could run faster or whatever, uh, which I loved because I was four years younger than him. But anyway, um, when my second son, William, was born about two years ago, he, uh, he came to visit us. Hadn't seen him for about six months. And, um, and so I hadn't seen him, and I didn't know that he'd actually entered into strict training. He lost in the course of about six months, about 40 pounds. Uh, he did it basically through cutting out soda, eating carrots at every meal, and then just going for runs a lot. So he came, you know, to, yeah, it was amazing. <laughs> so he came to the airport and um, I almost didn't recognize him. He's like 40 pounds lighter, he looks amazing. I'm like, David, you look so good. Uh, what have you done? He said, I just ate a lot of carrots. So anyway, so he was running pretty much every day at that time. And so while he was staying with us, he's like, hey, John, you wanna go for a run? I'm like, yeah, that sounds great. I hadn't particularly been working out, but I still thought I would definitely beat him because I was had growing up, you know, whatever. So. Um, so we went for a run together, and he left me in the dust. I mean, just embarrassing. I was just crawling on the floor to get to the finish line. He's like there, not even breaking a sweat. So anyway, it was just amazing. I was just amazed by how much his life had transformed um, in six months. He just seemed like a different person. It happened through training. Uh, that's when I started to run again. My competitive instinct kicked in. I thought, I can't, can't let this happen. I've got to... Uh, Got to keep up with my older brother. So, but the, the thing is, is that training uh, has an amazing power uh, to transform our lives. And it's the provision of God. It's the grace of God to us that he instructs us in training and says, you can actually, again, your life can be transformed. You can come to look like Christ, uh, partner with me in training. Now, when we start to talk about these things, um, it's easy to, I can start to feel uncomfortable because I don't want to be legalistic and I want to sound legalistic. Maybe there's um, some of you out here thinking, oh, I feel a little uncomfortable because this is starting to sound a little legalistic. You know what I'm talking about? Uh, and I don't, I don't want to be into legalism. I don't want to be into works, these kind of things. Um, 
And so I want to talk about that a little bit because a fear of legalism uh, at times can actually hold us back. A misunderstanding of legalism can hold us back from entering into the training that God has for us. Or even worse, we can use legalism as an excuse for not doing the things that we know we should do. Well, I don't want to be legalistic. I don't want to be into works. Uh, which, by the way, you know that as the people of God, we're supposed to be into works, right? Um, the Bible says that God created good works in advance that we should walk in them. In Revelation, it says um, that the bride of Christ, they're clothed in white garments. And it says, what are these garments? It's the good works of the saints. So we don't do them in legalism, but we're absolutely uh, working for God. So, uh, like I said, I want to talk about a couple of misunderstandings of legalism. So hopefully my aim here is that I just set us free and unleash us into uh, being a disciplined people and training together and not being concerned about whether that's legalism or not, okay? So that's where we're going this morning. <clears throat> and the first point is this, is that training draws us into grace. One of the things that we worry about is that we're moving away from grace when we start to talk about these topics, but the truth is, is that training draws us into grace. So the kind of change, the kind of transformation that we're talking about is only possible by grace, okay? So we're not moving away from grace at all when we start to talk about this topic. We're talking about leaning into grace all the more. So to even want to grow in this kind of way would be impossible without grace, all right? As I'm talking, if there was no grace on your life, you would be sitting there thinking, why would I want to look like God? I hate God, right? If you have no grace on your life, that would be your mindset. But if you're sitting here thinking, no, I love God. I want to know him more and I want to be like him. What I'm saying is this, that is grace on your life. And to lean into that, to cooperate with that, isn't a move away from grace at all. That's leaning into grace all the more. So Dallas Willard said it like this, the transformation of the inner being is as much or more a gift of grace as is our justification before God. So when you got saved, it was a gift of grace. But now as you start to grow in godliness, it's a gift of grace, just the same, all the more. In fact, we consume the most grace by leading a holy life in which we must be constantly upheld by grace not by continuing to sin and being repeatedly forgiven. So in other words, when you get to the end of your Christian walk, the analysis is going to be your life was covered by grace. Okay, covered by grace. It's either going to be you just never really got your act together. You had to be forgiven over and over again. And God's that gracious that he pours out that grace upon you. Or it looks like you lived a transformed life. You actually began to look more like God than John Pendray. And that is totally, again, the grace of God poured out in our lives. God's so gracious either way, but the question is, which grace do you want to access, right? We need this. We always need this. We fall short in many ways, but I want this kind of grace, right? I want to know myself being upheld by his grace. So again, when we start to partner with God in growing in these things, we're pressing into grace all the more. The end of his quote says, the interpretation of grace as having only to do with guilt and the forgiveness of sins is utterly false to biblical teaching and renders spiritual life in Christ unintelligible. Again, what he's saying is that grace covers you so much, but it would be a tragedy if you didn't access this grace to actually grow in godliness. Amen? Amen. Yeah, if you agree with anything, you've got an amen in your heart, just uh, amen, it, amen it out. Amen. Come on. Okay, second thing I want to say about legalism is this. Legalism, um, let's see, <clears throat> training always draws us into intimacy. Okay, so what legalism does on the surface is that it, um, it seems to add things to the Christian life. So here's my Christian life, and then legalism, now you have to do this, this, and this as well. It seems like it's adding things to the Christian life. But at its root, what legalism does is it reduces the Christian life down to less than what it could be. And what I mean is this. We have a call to love and worship and serve God with our whole lives. It's an all-consuming thing. And what legalism does is it comes and says, well, instead of that, can you just give me some simple rules that I could follow? Right? Can I, if I just do this, this, and this that I feel like I can manage, then I'm okay and I can live my own life my own way. You see how legalism just reduced our Christian life down? So instead of love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, it's just make sure to read a chapter of the Bible a day, and now you're okay. 
what legalism does, it always draws us away from intimacy, right? So our heart is, I want to know God, I want to know him better. What legalism says is just do these things and you're okay. Don't, you don't even have to worry about growing close to God. Just, just accomplish these tasks. Uh, but what discipline, what training does is it always says, I love God with my whole heart. I want to grow closer to him. How can I do it? Give me some tools. Give me some ways. So when Jesus talked about the Pharisees, who were the legalists of his day, he didn't say, well, don't worry about those Pharisees. They, have, oh, they just have so many rules. You don't need to be as righteous as that. What he said was, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of God. Because we're talking about a completely different kind of righteousness. It's a righteousness that, that says, blessed are the poor in heart. You know, we approach God every day and say, I need you. I want to be intimate with you. I'm poor in heart without you. It's the kind of righteousness that says, blessed are the peacemakers, that my whole life is given to accomplishing the peace that God wants on the earth. And again, legalism is the opposite of that. It just reduces things back down and draws us away from God. So again, if you're sitting here and you're thinking, God, just, I wish God would just get off my back. Just give me three things that I have to do. I'll get them done and then I can move on with my life. Then yes, that is kind of legalistic. But if you're saying, no, I love God. I'm devoted to him. I want to know him. I want to look like him. I want to follow him. Now, what specific things can I do? How can I train to grow in these ways? You are a million miles away from legalism. That is not the heart of a legalist at all. Third thing I want to say about this is that training draws us into godly habits. Uh, this is like Captain Obvious because training basically is godly habits. Um, but <clears throat> as a people, we can tend to have a, um, a suspicion and a wariness of habit because we don't want to be legalistic. We don't want to be tied into cold, dead religion, those kind of things. Uh, but the truth is that we are people of habit. Whether we like it or not, whether we know it or not, that's the way God created us to be. So the real question is just simply, are you cultivating bad habits in your life or are you cultivating good habits in your life? But either way, you're going to be kind of, your life is going to be pulled along by the habits that you establish in your life. Uh, if you don't think this is true, then just observe next time you brush your teeth. I guarantee you'll start with the same teeth that you always start with. It's a, it's a little ritual in your life. You might not have even known that you had it, but you always do it the exact same way. And you don't have to think about it because you build this habit into your life and it just draws you along. Now, the same thing is true with godly habits. We want to build them into our lives. We want them to become such a part of us that they draw us along into godliness. But again, we can have a mistrust of routines per se because we're wary of them being empty. We don't want them to be empty. We can assume that anything that we're doing over and over again equals to cold, dead religion, these kind of things. And we tend to put a value on things that are, um, feel spontaneous and things that feel new. Do you guys know what I'm talking about? So I prayed this. I've been on a worship time, and I prayed, God, we don't just want another worship time. We want something new this morning. We pray that you do something that you've never done before, right? And I know, I know my heart. I know what I'm saying in it, but, but I feel like talking to my old self and saying, no, 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 don't pray that. I want, I want the worship time to look exactly the same as it looked last week. You know, we have, as a church, we have a habit or a routine or, dare I say, even a ritual that we give over a good portion of our meeting every week to singing, right? To exalting the name of God in song. And it looks pretty similar every week, right? We do songs, we hear prophetic words, and uh, it takes about 35 minutes. And that's a great thing. We, we make no apologies for it at all because it's full of life. It's this habit that draws us into godliness. It's this routine that draws us together and lifts our eyes back up to Christ. And so we say, yes, that's a good habit. We're holding on to that. We're keeping that. We're not going to move away from that at all. I don't want to try something new just for the sake of newness. I want to be given to the habits, the disciplines that God has given me in order to draw us closer to him and closer into Christ-likeness. Now, obviously, if we lose sight of why we're doing things, we should re, uh, recapture the meaning or perhaps even stop them if they've lost all meaning altogether. But, um, but that's just a simple process. We just add meaning back to the habits that we have. So for me and my wife, you know, we both grew up um, in families that prayed right before dinner time. So when we uh, got married and started a family, we just, almost without thinking about it, we would just pray uh, before dinner time. And that's, um, that's not a bad thing at all. That, that's a great thing. I'm, I'm glad that we did it. 
But a little while ago, we started to feel convicted on, does this moment of our day have as much meaning as it could? And so we just made a resolve that we're not going to eat food until we know that we've genuinely uh, had a grateful heart and thanked God for it, and until we've genuinely lifted up some prayers and petitions before God. So on the surface, it looks like exactly the same habit, but it's totally transformed because we put meaning into it. Does this make sense? And so that's what we do with our habits. We just come back again and again. So this is why I'm doing it. And I'm doing it uh, because I want to win. I want to grow to be like God. You know, again, going back to the marathon runner example, if they were, um, you know, training every day and running, you wouldn't say, wow, that looks a little, looks a little legalistic to me. You say, wow, they look like they're going to win. That looks like the athlete who's going to win. And that's the same for us. We want to be th this church that looks like it's going to win. And the win is right honoring God in our whole lives. So let's be given to training. Let's enter into it. N.T. Wright said it like this. The end goal is grand. Life. The power of death, decay, and deconstruction is so strong that if life the new life that God longs to give to his whole creation is to win. It must involve and engage all the energies of God's people in working for it. This God is the living God. So again, we're not after the new spiritual experience or a new spiritual high. We're into training. We're into building these disciplines into our lives. You know, if I'm talking to someone and they say, I just, I used to experience God so much in the worship times, but... But recently, it's, it started to feel more like, more like a discipline. I'm like, great, you're in a great place. Press into that discipline. God's going to use it to change you and transform you uh, all the more so. So it's, it's simply this. If we have any legalism in our lives, let's just confess it, uh, be done with it, and let's not let it hold us back from en entering into training to being given to a people who are trained together. Can we do that together? So uh, concluding thoughts, you know, training is not easy, but it is, uh, it's very simple. So if we started to talk about the kinds of things that training look like, it's not going to blow anyone's mind at all. Uh, you know, Matthew 6 is a great place to start. Jesus talks about prayer. He talks about fasting, and he talks about giving. And he actually says these exact things. He says, don't be legalistic about it. Don't do it for the praise of people, but do it, and your Father in heaven will see you and reward you. And so let's be given to these things. So that's a great place to start. Another good place to start is a, a book called Celebration of Discipline that Richard Foster wrote. He talks In that book, he talks about uh, 12 different disciplines. It's not uh, an exhaustive list, but it is a helpful list. It's up here. Okay, so meditation, prayer, fasting. That one's no fun. <laughs> Study. I like that one. Um, simplicity, solitude, submission, service, confession, worship, guidance, celebration. That's a good one. And so, again, these are just things that we simply take, and, and our heart attitude is, God, uh, I want to grow to be like you. Give me the tools. What, what do I need to start implementing into my life? And so I just want to leave us with three uh, questions as we go out from here, three things to really, these questions are just a launch pad into thinking, what should this look like in my life? So uh, home group leaders, uh, you do whatever you want this week, but these, this could be a great thing to talk about and discuss together as home groups. Uh, and the questions are this, first of all, where do you need to grow? And again, for a lot of us, this is going to be obvious. We're just aware of that area in our life. I want this to change. I know that it doesn't honor God. I want to grow here. Um, but another great idea would just be to ask someone else. You know, sometimes we have blind spots in our lives and someone sees clearly something in us that we um, didn't see. If you have a spouse, you could definitely ask them. They're for sure going to have thoughts on that one. So. <laughs> but that's the first question is, God, how, uh, how do I need to grow? What do I need to grow in? The second question is this. What are you going to do to train yourself in godliness? So again, ask God to speak to you. Which uh, disciplines do you want me to start engaging in afresh? And the third question is this. Who are you going to do it with? Okay, and this is absolutely essential because this isn't something that we're doing as individuals 
uh, off by ourselves. The point isn't to become the best version of you. The point is that as a congregation, we want to be the body of Christ. Yes, and we can't do that if we're off by ourselves. Uh, it has to happen in community. It has to happen together. So the third question here, which is absolutely, absolutely essential, is who am I doing this with? How am I partnering with the body of Christ in working these things into my life? And as we do these things, as we keep it clear in our head that we're a million miles away from legalism, but we're pressing into grace, we're pressing into intimacy, we're pressing into building uh, good habits into our lives, I believe that we're going to be absolutely transformed. I believe that in the weeks and months to come, we're going to look like a different congregation because we've grown into this grace that God's given us for training and for looking like him. So um, let's pray together to end. God, I thank you so much for your grace. Thank you that you pour it out on our lives in amazing ways. And God, we just say thank you that there's a grace here for us to change, to be transformed, to grow, to look like you. God, we commit to leaning into that grace. We commit to partnering with you. And God, we say we're after the goal of Christ-likeness. We want to train in godliness. We want to look like you and honor you with our whole lives, Father. Amen. Amen. All right, great job, guys.